family mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Richard Mercott, and this morning we have attendees from Australia and New Zealand. This event is being hosted by Land Information New Zealand. It's been coordinated by teams from the New Zealand Geospatial Office and the Canterbury SDI program, working with our guest speaker this morning. I wish to acknowledge my colleagues Byron Cochrane and Darren Priddy for their initiatives and efforts enabling this opportunity to be taken. So thank you. So there's been some improvements with the ISO metadata standards. What does it mean to me? It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Ted Haberman. Ted is the Director of Earth Science at the HDF Group, and I'll assume that you've read Ted's impressive bio. But I must highlight a very pertinent aspect. Ted is Project Leader and Editor for the new ISO metadata standard, uh, particularly Part 3, XML Schema Implementation of Metadata Fundamentals. And this morning, Ted is joining us from Boulder, Colorado, where it's late Thursday afternoon over there. Since 2003, the geospatial community has benefited from an international consensus on best practice, on how to structure documentation about our valued resources. It was timely to re revise this consensus after a decade of international application experience and here in Australasia that's been through the ANSLIC metadata profile. Earlier this year, the revised consensus was published as ISO 19115-1-2014, Geographic Information Metadata, Part 1, Fundamentals. It's my pleasure to invite Ted to uh, proceed with the presentation this morning. Thank you very much, Ted. I'm passing over control to you. Great. Okay, Richard, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen at this point. Yes, thank you, Ted. Okay, and if you mute now, then I hope the echo will uh, minimize, hopefully. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is Ted Haberman. As Richard mentioned, I'm in, uh, in Colorado. It's uh, about the same temperature here as it is there. Um, the, as Richard also mentioned, that the ISO standards are evolving, and several things have happened. Uh, the metadata uh, standard has been revised from 19115 to 19115-1, and uh, in April of this year that became an international standard. That's the conceptual model. <clears throat> in addition, the data quality metadata has moved from 19115 to 19157. Uh, that is also an accepted uh, international standard. So these are both conceptual models. Um, and as Richard mentioned, I've been working with a number of people to try and make the implementations for those. Uh, I think evolution is good, and I'm wanting to talk today about some of the some some of the benefits. Only a small sample, actually, <clears throat> of the benefits of this process of evolving these standards. Uh, the format for the presentation today is going to look like this: uh, a, a statement that. Uh, some of you might make, and then uh, a discussion of, of, of or a response to those statements. So the first statement is, uh, I'm confused by all those numbers, or these numbers. <clears throat> um, ISO divides itself into two things, uh, conceptual models and implementations. And in, in, <clears throat> in metadata, there's maybe four, and there's probably some other uh, conceptual models that are sort of important. Uh, the metadata model, the model for metadata for imagery, metadata for features and feature catalogs and services. <clears throat> and historically, or up at this point now, there, there are two XML implementations in existence. One, 19139 is the implementation for 19115, and 19139-2 is the implementation for uh, the imagery uh, standard. <clears throat> Um, most of these, these conceptual models will stay, 
and there'll be models for the same thing. The services metadata is going into 19115-1, 19157 is a new uh, quality uh, model, and there are, right now, we're working on two XML implementations. Um, the, what's, one of the interesting things about the way that ISO works in the past is for each model, there has been a particular XML schema. So as I mentioned earlier, for 19115, there was a schema in a standard called 19139. And, and the, de the delay in the creation of the implementation uh, on the right, 19139, was 3.3 .3 years. 19115-2 <clears throat> is imagery. It was 5.8 5 years between the time that 19115 was done and the imagery was done. And then it was 3.6 years before the XML implementation of that. Uh, we now have the revision, which I mentioned became a standard in April, <clears throat> and the scheduled release of, of the schema for that is, is next May. Um, in fact, there is, I'll show later, a URL that uh, would point you to a schema right now. But so one of the important things that we're trying to do is decrease the, the time period between the conceptual model and an implementation of that model. This is important for things like data quality, where, which we're, we're, the, the standard is about a year old, I think, and we've got a schema for that now. Uh, 19130 is a standard that doesn't have any schema. <clears throat> but the important thing is that we're now creating these schemas directly from the UML models using software developed uh, by, in an OGC, an Open Geospatial Consortium testbed, and this capability is also being added directly into the tool. This is the uh, Enterprise Architect uh, UML modeling tool by Spark Systems. So the goal of all of this is to, is to make implementations uh, faster uh, so that we can and actually make the, the time period between the conceptual model and the implementation essentially zero so that we can test implementations, at least XML implementations, <clears throat> and possibly OWL implementations quickly while the standard is being developed. Another thing that's been uh, an approach that ISO is using in the past is that each conceptual standard on the left, and once again, what these numbers are is not all that important, but the, the fact that each conceptual model on the left had its own implementation standard is what's important about this picture. And each of these boxes involves a team of people that get together and discuss things for some amount of time and, and uh, write documents, and those documents go through reviews and et cetera, et cetera. So the creation of each of these boxes is, uh, is a fair amount of, of work. What we're trying to do now is uh, unite um, the schema, the XML implementations for essentially all of these, all of these conceptual models into one standard. And since you guys are in, in New Zealand, you know, I had to say this is uh, one, one schema to unite them all. And I think that this is going to, the hope is that this will make the implementation of these standards much easier. If you want to become familiar with and, and test the new implementation, <clears throat> I mentioned that there is a GitHub repository. This is publicly available. Uh, and this has the, the schemas that are up to date. Um, as, uh, as, as often as, as I update uh, those schema on my, uh, my computer here, uh, I update this repository. So these are up to date, uh, as up to date as they can be. And we've already got some uh, changes and uh, you know, possible bugs uh, in the schema being recognized, mostly in the transform, actually, from the old to the new models. But uh, Steve Richard in the United States and Peter um, Parslow in, in the UK and uh, uh, Francois Prunier, who some of you probably know from, uh, from Geo Network, are all uh, helping to work on these. <clears throat> um, if, we wanna, if you have existing metadata that you'd like to migrate to 19115, uh, the standard includes a transform, uh, which transforms uh, 19111. The 19139 metadata in the 19115-3, uh, and this transform is also available 
uh, on that uh, GitHub uh, repository. And this is something that uh, I wrote and I've been working on, uh, you know, trying to test it. So it's, it's particularly helpful for me to have uh, a diverse collection of, of records uh, to try and test or to help test or to find problems. Because as many of you know, <clears throat> people do things in, in, in slightly different ways and I'd like to be able to uh, account for those. <clears throat> also, I know a lot of people uh, in New Zealand and Australia are using GeoNetwork, a great tool, great uh, metadata repository tool, um, and you might be interested in trying 19115-1 uh, with that. Uh, Francois is um, working on a, uh, a GeoNetwork plugin uh, for 19115-1, or the, the, the schema, which is dash 3. And uh, this is also available uh, openly and publicly. And as I mentioned, he's got the most up-to-date schema uh, going here. So our hope is to uh, you know, have GeoNetwork uh, uh, be ready to use these new, uh, the new improvements uh, very soon, um, even now. And I've also worked with ESRI, uh, the GIS company in um, in uh, the United States, well, all over the world, actually, and they've got, uh, they've also been doing some uh, testing with early versions of this. <clears throat> so there's a lot of opportunities to help test and to, and and to have input at this point to make sure these tools work. One of the things that really is important uh, these days, particularly as metadata records are shared across a wide variety of repositories, is unambiguously identifying them. Uh, in 19115, there was a character string called file identifier, and I know most of you are uh, familiar with this because it was required <coughs> in the Anslet profile, but that because it was just a character string, it had to be overloaded in, in a lot of situations to include information uh, required for unambiguous identification. So, for instance, um, the, the samples of metadata from New Zealand that I, I worked with a little bit last few weeks had UUIDs, which are very nice. Uh, they're opaque identifiers, which is good. Um, but the question of who, if, if all I have is this identifier, this character string, the question of who owns this metadata or, or who's responsible for this identifier, uh, you know, can't be answered. Is there a question? Oh, okay. Um, if you guys have questions, either raise your hand or, or if you're in the room, uh, talk to Richard and we'll try and get them to me as soon as possible. Um, in 19115-1, we uh, replace this character string with an M MD identifier, and that identifier has been improved with the uh, addition of a code space. <clears throat> so now this little uh, snippet of XML shows the identifier that we saw previously, and also uh, along with it, the code space of the uh, organization that's uh, responsible for that identifier. So I think this will help a lot in terms of, particularly as I mentioned earlier, where metadata records are shared across a variety of repositories. Tracking the metadata life cycle is, is uh, an important thing. Uh, metadata evolves along with uh, improved understanding uh, of data sets and also just improved additions to the metadata. In uh, 19115, there was a date stamp, a single date stamp, <clears throat> which was the creation time for the metadata. So what that meant was that you could record the creation time of the metadata, but uh, that was the only kind of date that you could uh, associate with the metadata. Of course, many kinds of dates are important in the life cycle of metadata. <clears throat> so in 19115, uh, it allows you to include any number of, of CI date objects uh, for the metadata, and those CI date objects include uh, date types, so you can uh, track the metadata throughout its life cycle. Um, also, we've added a, a, a large a significant number of new uh, data types. And in some of these slides, there will be uh, little blocks of, of UML like this, and the new things are red. So 
in 19115, there were three date types included, creation, publication, and revision. In 19115-1, 13 new types were, uh, were added. And so we have a much uh, broader uh, standard vocabulary for uh, describing types of dates. Of course, this is a code list, so if, if need be, or uh, communities can, can add other things to this code list if they need other, other types as well. Uh, I have many existing documentation resources that can help users. I tend to try and distinguish between uh, the word documentation and the word metadata. Uh, documentation is, is the complete collection, of my definition anyway, is the, the complete um, collection of everything needed to make science reproducible. Uh, and <clears throat> the metadata is the, the standard and structured subset of that documentation. So, and metadata makes it easier for users to, to, to uh, use and understand data sets that they didn't create or to discover those data sets. <clears throat> but there are a number of other kinds of resources that, that uh, are, might be published papers, they might be uh, you know, a variety of things. In 19115, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, uh, resources or that you could cite the citations. In 19115-1, uh, there are 10 that are added. So things like uh, detailed format specifications, um, uh, citations to metadata uh, standards, uh, citations to alternate metadata that might exist for a given resource, uh, citations to additional documentation, which could be scientific papers, uh, it could be data dictionaries, it could be uh, user guides. Um, you know, websites, all different kinds of, of things that you can connect. And I think this is an important element uh, about the ISO standards. Um, they, they, in the creation of these standards, we realize that, that the ISO metadata is only a part of the uh, complete picture when it comes to uh, sustainable and reproducible science. And uh, so that's it's very important to have uh, the metadata be able to act sort of like a hub with connections to many other kinds of, uh, of documentation resources. So this is very important. Um, of course, these days, most, if not all, uh, of these resources are on the web. <clears throat> one of the real problems that we had in 19115, uh, and it's sort of one of the uh, amazing things, <laughs> was that uh, citations did not have online resources that were clearly associated with them. So it was impossible to, to uh, it wasn't clear how you would cite a, a web resource uh, from a metadata uh, record. Uh, in, in this works well for books and journal articles and other physical resources, but obviously doesn't work for the web. So, in 19115-1, we added two important elements to the citation. Uh, we have the online resource that gives you a web address for the cited uh, resource. And we added uh, a graphic that can be associated with that citation. So what this means is, of course, many of us are used to clicking on pictures on the web um, and having those, those uh, pictures be links. Um, and now we can include uh, that kind of information in the metadata record. These might be browse graphics, they might be organization logos, they might be uh, you know, all kinds of whatever pictures uh, that you might uh, find helpful for your users um, in, in the metadata. And then, of course, when we're presenting that metadata in HTML, uh, they become clickable, uh, clickable images. This is, I think, there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of big improvements, um, and I, I think this is really um, one of the most uh, most impactful. Uh, you know, just adding a, 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 an online resource to a citation is, I think, really going to make a huge difference. Um, 
One of the things I noticed in uh, a bunch of records that uh, I got from New Zealand was that uh, some people were using the Creative Commons licensing for their data. Um, in 1915, there were very limited uh, descriptions of constraints related to the data, <clears throat> either constraints caused by some or related to some aspect of the data, like the accuracy of it, or constraints imposed by organizations. And uh, it was difficult in that, in the context of those, to describe commonly used open source licenses. And of course, that's because, uh, partially at least, because many of them didn't exist in, in, in you know, 2000 or so when that standard was being created. <clears throat> um, I mentioned the marine community profile uh, with some, some metadata in New Zealand has an object called the MD Commons uh, object and it has a few URLs and, and a few different things. And in, in 19115, we expanded the constraints quite a bit, and actually the Creative Commons license was one of the things that we used as, as a model for the, for the kinds of things that we uh, had to think about <clears throat> and, and include in the revision of the standard. And um, you know, I took a look at, at these MD Commons, uh, the content in those, and 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 I think I was able to uh, uh, map all of those to um, to the new standard. But and so that's clearly important for the marine community profile. But it's also a great example of how communities can contribute to the uh, improvement of these international standards. A another really nice thing about uh, ISO is that it allows itself, uh, it includes a standard way to extend itself. So this Commons, this Creative Commons license uh, used by the Marine Community Profile is a great example of a, a metadata need that either existed or emerged in a community and, um, and was addressed using a, uh, an extension to the ISO standard. <clears throat> and then you know, the ISO standards are revised every three to five, I think every five years, there's an opportunity to, uh, to re begin a revision process. So <clears throat> the revision process can take advantage of, of these ideas and, and uh, uh, implementations of those ideas that have been done by communities um, <clears throat> and, and include those in the, future, in the future revision of the standard. And this, I think, is a really uh, great example of that. I would mention one other example that uh, has yet to uh, come to fruition. I do a lot of work with uh, NOAA and uh, uh, NASA uh, and, and uh, ocean observing systems that, that uh, use instruments and, and platforms to, to make observations. And uh, we've had to extend the ISO standards uh, for those groups in order to include characteristics of, of instruments. Um, obviously, the ISO standard is, is designed to be generic, and we don't want to have a, a, you know, an XML um, element for every property of every instrument that anybody might use, but we extended it in a general way, and um, the, uh, that part of the metadata standard what is now 19115-2 is uh, coming up for revision in the near future. So if there are people or groups or, or uh, you know, communities in New Zealand and, uh, and Australia or, or other places in the world that have uh, also had to extend the ISO standards to define their instruments, this is the time for them to uh, uh, you know, share those uh, those extensions that they've needed, so that we can, uh, you know, hopefully uh, incorporate them, or you know, bring them together and incorporate them in the revision of that standard. This is a great example of that. Um, my data sets include measured parameters, reference, and quality information. Uh, back in the old days, um, uh, you know, data sets, there were a lot of simple data sets. There were data sets that had a physical parameter in them, uh, <clears throat> and uh, people used those, and, and many times uh, un uncertain about how, how 
how they were uh, measured or, or the quality of them. And in, in the past, 19115, this kind of information goes into the content information section of, of the standard. <clears throat> and this is the section where really the most, uh, the most change has happened. Um, one thing was that 19115 only allowed one type of information in each content information section. And um, so in this little UML picture, this says there's a coverage description at the top, and it includes something called an attribute group. And that attribute includes something called a content type. So that content type element used to be up above in the, in the coverage description, which meant that you could only have um, you could only have one type of content in each coverage description. Uh, as our data sets, or what we call data sets, become more complicated and more complete, we want to include other kinds of information, either ancillary information or maybe some reference information, maybe some quality information. <clears throat> and to make that a little bit cleaner, we created this thing called the attribute group which has the, can have multiple content types. And then down below this, this the attributes are the, are the variables or the, the parameters that are in the data set. So within one coverage description, you could have quality information, you could have measured parameters, you could have uh, reference information, et cetera. And in fact, some of those layers might be, uh, have, have multiple content, can, multiple content types. For instance, you might have a measured parameter uh, that is related to the quality of another parameter uh, in a data set. <clears throat> um, a lot of situations, uh, there are a lot of situations similar to that these days where people uh, you know, have uh, quality information that's, that's measured along with uh, the, the, so the target parameter, or they might have reference for in, in, uh, information. For instance, if you're looking at uh, models of salinity or currents in, in the ocean, uh, you might have a reference layer, which is the bathymetry of the ocean and also the sea surface uh, height. Uh, because in, in a lot of those situations, those two reference layers are used to define the coordinate system uh, that's used to uh, to describe the, the currents or the you know the, the the properties of the ocean. So that's a situation where you need um, you know you need reference information along with your measured or modeled parameters uh, to try and uh, make them uh, usable and understandable. <clears throat> I mentioned model parameters there. This is another code list that we expanded uh, in, in the revision 19115-1. So we have image, it used to be that we have images and thematic classification and physical measurement. We added reference information, auxiliary data, quality information, model results, and coordinates. Uh, many of, uh, many people that I know um, in Australia and, and New Zealand use um, uh, things like uh, the NetCDF and, and HDF uh, data formats. And uh, in, those, uh, in those situations, there are uh, coordinate things that have a different number of dimensions than the data. For instance, if you have two-dimensional gridded data, that has two uh, variables in, in NetCDF or, or uh, CF a variable which is the latitude and a variable which is the longitude. And those two variables, latitude and longitude, are one-dimensional variables, whereas the data set is really is two-dimensional. So we added that coordinate uh, uh, type so that you could um, you could say here's a here's a parameter that's in this data set. It's a coordinate, so its dimensionality is different than the dimensionality of the data set that it is a coordinate for. I, I hope that that was clear. <laughs> if, if, if there are people there that are using CF or, or NetCDF, I, I hope that you understand what I meant. <laughs> uh, we also have model results. There's a lot of situations where uh, you know people have models and uh, we want to document them well. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> you know, sort of practically what this means is in the past, um, this content, you would, you would need multiple content information sections, in this case, one that might be a physical uh, measurement, one that might be reference information, and one that might be quality information, and now um, we can bring all of those together and create a more uh, compact or sort of modular uh, content information piece <clears throat> that has multiple uh, multiple coverages or multiple parameters in it. Um, one of the ways that this, uh, you know, this is, this, this is, as I mentioned, this is an area that changed significantly in, in the revision of the standard. Um, I talked a little bit about communities. Uh, communities are very important in, in my work with, with metadata. In, in the creation of, of 19115, um, uh, it was the, the, there was a the there was a community of uh, I, I think it was many um, defense uh, related people that were involved in that process and um, their content information descriptions <clears throat> were really only considered uh, pictures where where you had an instrument that was taking pictures of things, taking pictures of, of parts of the earth or, or things uh, on the earth. And, and it was very difficult to use, it was actually impossible to use that model for describing uh, calculated parameters where you make some observation or it could be a sea, you know, a sea surface, temperature kind of a thing, where you make some observation and you have a grid uh, you, you present results of that in a grid. <clears throat> we really uh, improved the standard for describing those kinds of things. And this is one example of that. Uh, another example is um, a situation where you're naming the parameters that are in your data set. Um, and you know, here it says my group uses local parameter names, but we need standard names to share. And this is something that's very uh, typical in, uh, in situations where groups create data, they use them uh, for a specific purpose that they're observed, that they're observed for, and maybe they share those observations within their group. But then when there's another group, um, it could be uh, down the hall, uh, in the same office building, uh, in the same uh, organization or in another organization around the world, they use different names for those parameters. In ISO 19115, this, there's a thing called sequence identifier, um, which is sort of an obscure name, uh, but it only allowed one local name for parameters. So everybody had to un either use the same name for everything, and that's sort of impossible, or be able to understand other people's names. <clears throat> so this is the same little blob of of, of UML on the right here, but at the bottom, these these attributes, which are the parameters, we added in this name, uh, this name thing down there, and it's actually an identifier. And and you notice where it says zero dot dot star, uh, that means you can have any number of these things. And if we remember from earlier, uh, the MD identifier has a namespace, so it so this is this is what it looks like. And so this allows you to say, here's a group other than the group that created this uh, data set that calls this parameter something else. Uh, on the left-hand side, the identifier used to just have a code and a citation to the authority for that code. And the citation was very hard to use. Um, for the simple uh, piece, the simple need of giving a, just a namespace to these parameters. So we borrowed actually from the RS identifier and added in code, code space and version and description to all of the identifiers. So what that means is, is you, if, you, if you have a parameter in your data, it could be called a temp, and that could either be a temperature or maybe it's air temperature. You know, if I'm using this data set, I'm not really exactly sure what that means. But now you can add in um, names, standard names for that parameter that come from some other place um, or some other group. So in this case, these two examples, uh, as I mentioned, I, I do a lot of work with uh, HDF 
and, uh, and net CDF data and the, the, the climate forecast uh, conventions. One of the really important things that they bring to the table is a, uh, a, a vocabulary of, of names that can be shared across different uh, groups. So here this, this variable might be called air temperature in the CF uh, name list and in the, the global change master directory, another thing that's uh, uh, you know, from the United States, I, I apologize for that, uh, but it's used in, in a number of different places around the world and it also has a set of names uh, for parameters. So now uh, what this means is that your data set that used to be just a temp and only you or your group knew what that meant can now be shared with other groups and, and they can look up um, parameters in that uh, in those data sets by uh, you know a, a parameter with a from particular uh, shared vocabulary. Uh, obviously this is important for understanding what the parameters actually are and also supporting uh, discovery of, of data sets that include uh, specific parameters. Uh, many of us uh, either are or, or have been at some time in the distant past uh, scientists and uh, we, you know scientists publish papers and web pages that many times describe the quality of the data and um, in this is now we're in 19157 the new data quality um, standard these these existing uh, reports about data quality are called standalone reports and um, the metadata can include brief descriptions of the results of these reports and also citations to them. So this is a description that happens to come from a metadata record uh, that's somewhere in the, the Global Change Master Directory, I think. Um, <clears throat> it has, for its data quality standard, uh, this is in the, the directory interchange format, diff, data quality is just a blob of text. Uh, and in this case, this is the blob of text uh, describing something about this quality and, and down a few lines in this text, it has a, a, a reference and, and of course, um, I mean, if you happen to know who uh, Malik Gru is or what this paper is that he or she wrote in 1990, uh, that's wonderful. I don't happen to know. Uh, I was able to look it up and, and find a citation to it. And um, in the new quality uh, standard, we can include both the abstract, which is this description, and then the reference to uh, the paper that it's describing. So a user who's looking at just the metadata record can, can read this abstract and get an idea of uh, you know, what, what this, uh, this paper is about and maybe important results of it. And if they need uh, more information, they can connect to uh, this citation and get the complete uh, published standalone quality report. So this sort of um, you know refers also back to this idea of having multiple citations in the metadata and being able to point to a lot of different kinds of things. It also what it means is that for those of us that work with groups that have papers or web pages already that describe the quality of their data, we can immediately start using, um, you know, using the metadata standard to connect those reports and that information to users rather than worrying about restructuring uh, the information that's in those reports into the structure of the quality standard. So immediately users can, can benefit from uh, you know, citations to quality reports. Uh, without us doing much work um, <clears throat> in, in terms of trying to restructure that stuff. A lot of us also have data quality information in databases or web services um, and that's very, you know, very typical particularly where we're producing a lot of data sets as a function of time and um, the major elements of this new quality standard are, are separate components that can be independently connected to the metadata and reused in multiple records. So this is another um, another thing that I really like about uh, the approach that we use in ISO is connecting to existing resources is possible 
uh, either standalone reports as in the last slide or in this case a little more detailed um, the new quality standard is really uh, really nice in terms of a clean definition of, of measures which are sort of generic descriptions of how you're measuring quality the methods that you use to uh, apply those uh, measures to a particular data set and then the results of that application so in, in large organizations that produce a lot of data I mentioned I do a lot of work with NASA they have quite a few um, sort of standard quality measures uh, the same thing in, in the United States, at least, is, is probably, well, all over the world, many uh, organizations use quality measures defined by, say, the World Meteorological Organization, and they use that same measure over and over again, and, and maybe they apply it in a slightly different way to different data sets. That's what the methods is. And, of course, um, you know, many people are working with the WMO to try and make these things accessible with web services uh, and, and databases, and, and 19157 uh, makes it possible for us to connect to those. Of course, this is really important for consistency uh, and consistency of the descriptions of these measures across multiple products. If we can point to uh, you know a database and then reuse that information, I mean, everybody knows that that information normalization is, is an important step towards uh, uh, consistency. Finally, uh, this is something that I think is very interesting. Uh, users increase our understanding of data quality and of data, of course, and we need to keep them in the loop. <clears throat> uh, this is an example of a page, and you probably can't read this, but it uh, comes from the MODIS uh, science team, which is a, an, an instrument on a satellite. And this is the known problems page. So uh, the, the upper little blob of red text is about a water vapor product. And it says, uh, do not use the water vapor near IR product, product in collection six. There is a problem with the source WV near data in blah, 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 blah. Uh, but, so this is a problem that the science team or you know, perhaps a user identified um, after they began to produce this product. And of course this happens, this is actually the process that we call science, where we make observations and then we find uh, either answers from those observations or sometimes problems and we, and we uh, try and improve um, how we do things. In 19115, this is a, uh, a very uh, infrequently used item called MD usage, and the black uh, the black elements here what exist are what existed in 19115. They allowed uh, a user who was to specify how they were trying to use this data set at some time and to describe you know just a character string um, you know limitations that they. Uh, might have identified. Um, in 19115-1, um, we added in uh, a response here so that a data provider um, can respond to uh, one of these problems. And they can also have a citation. Again, I love citations. Uh, they can have any number of citations to you know, additional documentation. So scientific papers, reports, etc., web pages, uh, that describe this problem and how they um, responded to it. And then they can have a citation here to identify issues um, for, this, for this resource. So this web page I'm showing you now would be uh, a, a web citation to identify issues for a particular data set. Um, this idea of, of users um, you know, building up over time uh, uh, a knowledge uh, about a data set is something that um, I think is very exciting uh, and, and an area where a lot of good stuff is going to happen. Uh, there's two projects in Europe that are currently working on this. One is called uh, GeoVicua and um, uh, Joan Massal from Barcelona has proposed quite a, a significant extension uh, to this MD usage. Uh, actually, it's 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 a, a huge uh, model that um, includes things like 
feedback like this and uh, ratings for data sets and uh, ways to share summaries of those. Uh, there's another project in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, John Blower from the UK is working on, uh, it's called something like CORDS, I'm forgetting the acronym right now, but in that case they're using um, open annotation uh, to try to annotate data sets and, and to share those annotations across communities. So this is an area that I think is a very, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I would say, you know, buy stock. You know, I'm not sure I would recommend anyone buy stock in metadata. But uh, if, you're, if, if we have a stock market, I think this is an area that's we're going to see a lot of really important growth in the near future. Um, that's the, uh, the end of um, the first set of slides. I have another very short set of slides on uh, translating uh, between different metadata dialects. And at this point, um, I'd be happy to answer questions. And uh, Richard um, has also put together a poll of questions that we uh, were sort of experimenting Richard with. Experimenting with. Um, um, Yes, Ted. Um, I've got uh, two questions from the uh, audience gathered here in, in Wellington. Um, so I'd like to um, pose these uh, to you, Ted. Um, one arose whilst you were talking about um, the provisions in the new metadata standard for parameters. Um, the thought that came to mind was related actually to whether it could be, whether that was the appropriate part of uh, the metadata standard that could be used for um, linguistic variations in, in place names, for example, where there are um, different names for the same place or different spellings, perhaps, or um, was there another solution to that? Um, you know, I live in this, I live, I live in this, in this sort of I really big, big country. Big country. Let's see. It can, Let's see. Can you mute Richard at this point? Yeah, I'm getting an echo again. Well, I answer this, and, uh, and we're so all speak the same them. language. So I am actually a very, very not very good at, at the multilingual elements. Uh, Francois Pounier from uh, Switzerland has been helping me with that, and um, I. I, there's a little, there's some discussion going on in ISO right now about what the approach is going to be there. Um, you could, uh, and 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 so I think I'm hopeful that we will have a mechanism that works where you could extend the the code, uh, which is in you know in this case it's in an identifier, so it would be the name of the parameter in this case. You could extend that with uh, different languages. Or uh, you could use the you know the, the the namespace in those codes for identifying uh, different groups where those 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 different names come from. Um, you know, I think either one of those approaches I think would work. Um, and it's one of those you know I tend to try and get my uh, you know sort of get my rubber on the road. And if there are people in the audience that have multilingual needs. Um, I would I would love to uh, engage you in, in helping to um, make sure that whatever we decide there uh, is uh, you know works. Uh, I believe in the context of ISO. Um, I I <laughs> hopefully this isn't unfortunate. Uh, I think I'm the group that I'm leading right now is the group that's supposed to decide how we're going to do this. So this is an area where uh, I would love to have some help. I recall that okay, the, I, need to undo. Um, I need to undo. There we go. There we go. I recall, Ted, that the uh, group working on addressing um, the conceptual model for address has a, um, a notion, um, a class, a locale. Uh, we're not, um, haven't taken a lot of notice of it here in New Zealand yet, but maybe um, there are concepts like that that uh, might be relevant. Anyway, I have a second question that arose um, concerning M MD usage. Um, how could 
MD usage capability of user feedback be practically implemented as it implies the non-owners could modify metadata? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, MD usage is, is uh, another situation where having a database of information that users have given you back about uh, various uh, resources is, is a clear uh, place where this would be good. Um, I mean, having a database, you know, rather than just maintaining a bunch of XML, uh, you know, sort of adding things in, and, and the usage would be created dynamically from that database. Um, I, I think that in terms of the, uh, I mean, clearly users are important and they have important information about uh, resources and, and problems with those. Um, you know, this is a situation, I mean, crowdsourcing is a, is a big buzzword these days. Um, you know, community, uh, we, we're, we're very used to uh, a lot of situations in which citizen science is happening. Um, you know, people, highly qualified people or very motivated people are are providing information, and so any any organization that deals with that kind of input has to deal with these these questions, and um, uh, how you do that in 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 your own system is something that um, you know is going is going to vary. Obviously, you might want to do you know searches of of things for, for language that would be inappropriate or, you know, it, it, it's whoever uh, brought this question up, I, I agree that this is a, uh, this is a can of worms uh, in many ways, but I think it's uh, really critical for, for future users to be able to benefit from things that, that current users are, are discovering about the data. Another thing that happens in the U.S. Uh, well, in all over the world, actually, for these large uh, organizations that are correcting, collecting long-term data sets, they reprocess those data sets uh, on, you know, on some when when certain scientific problems are uh, identified. So this MD usage um, could be something that that uh, provide an input to those reprocessing uh, campaigns. And said, you know, we're we're reprocessing this data to fix these these problems that we identified as as science team members, and also these problems that were identified by particular users. So, um, I think it's a, it, and some of the stuff that Juan uh, Massal and the the uh, the GeoVequal work in in their proposed standards, they have a lot of uh, sort of user. Uh, qualification or user uh, classification kind of information um, included in there. And whether or not that's going to work um, or how useful that's going to be, uh, I think, you know, as I said, this is an area where I think there's going to be a lot of stuff going on and how to actually make it work practically will will hopefully emerge uh, over the next uh, couple of years from, from that that experience. Thank you, Ted. Um, I've uh, also, uh, we have a submission, uh, another question submitted uh, electronically. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Uh, uh, okay, uh, let's see if I click on this. Okay, the question is, um, in the range dimension, uh, the name can give the name and description of an attribute. Uh, is there a mechanism to define the allowable values uh, for that parameter? A um, couple ways to do that. Uh, in the past, uh, there was an MD band uh, class that had a minimum and a maximum value. <clears throat> Uh, and that, that was associated with one of these uh, range dimensions. Range dimensions. You could use that uh, minimum maximum value as uh, to define, you know, there's always a question about whether that defines 
the minimum and maximum allowable values or whether it defines the actual minimum and maximum in that instance of the data. Um, we also uh, added in using uh, the, the, the record and record type. Uh, ISO includes these, these two things, this pair of things called a record and a record type that allows you to uh, define implementation specific uh, things. And so you could use that, the record and the record type to uh, define un unambiguously uh, the minimum and maximum allowable values uh, for any parameter. Um, we also included a couple of other sort of simple uh, descriptive uh, statistics, uh, the mean and the standard deviation uh, in the standard so that you could, you could provide uh, simple descriptive statistics for your parameters <clears throat> uh, and then this record and record uh, type um, uh, mechanism would be used to uh, to provide uh, things that a particular community thought was important or useful so the so the minimum and maximum we probably should have put in the uh, minimum and maximum allowable values there as well but that's something that would, would be added on currently. Let's see. Okay. Um, I have a question about when will the new schema be included in the Esri metadata add-on? Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm completely unqualified, first of all, to uh, respond to a question, um, you know, about Esri, except with, with the answer that I'm sure it will be in the next version, which is how they uh, answer those questions quite a few times. Um, I think it's 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 fair to say that it will happen in GeoPortal um, uh, first. It will happen in uh, ArcMap and the, the sort of desktop environments later. And uh, Martin Hogvig, uh, who's the technical lead for GeoPortal, uh, and I were talking last week. <clears throat> they have already done an implementation, uh, sort of a limited implementation with a, a more with a uh, an earlier version of the schema, and they're interested in um, in updating that. Uh, I also talked to Christine White about that. So if you're interested, you know those are the people that that I would connect to. Um, uh, one other question, uh, another uh, good one. How can I describe a data set which is collected from various sources uh, at different times from various spatial regions? Um, that's a data provocative TA is. I'm not quite sure what a TA is. Uh, the answer to this question depends a little bit on whether you're you're creating a data set which is which is sort of an integrated data set that integrates a bunch of different sources. Um, in that case, you would do that with uh, source extents, which are in the, um, the lineage section of the data quality. Um, so, so if you've got you know, five different data sets for, say, um, hydrography or something, or for you know, detailed bathymetry, and they were collected at different times, um, uh, in, in different parts of, say, a bay or something, and you were trying to integrate those, you would do it with, with sources and source extents. If you're doing it with uh, one data set that's sort of one data set that's collected in different locations at different times, you would do that with uh, multiple extents in the um, MD identification section where you're, where you're saying this data set has multiple extents. So one of the situations where that happens is if you have a certain uh, collection instrument and you move that instrument around, say, um, from summer to, if you have you know, a, a collection, a time period during which you can make collections, you might move that uh, instrument around um, and, and make different observations, say, during, during different summers. Um, and in that case, you would use multiple extents in the MD identification. So, Heiko, if you've got specific, uh, you know, examples or questions, I can, I, I'd be happy to take a look at those. Uh, 
Margie has another question, but for character values. Um, uh, I, I assume, Margie, that what you're asking about here is minimum and maximum uh, 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 allowable values for character uh, parameters. Um, there is something that actually hasn't been used much called the uh, range element. Um, I'm even forgetting the name of it right now. Uh, the range element something, um, which is used uh, in theory at least for um, data sets that have, uh, you know, like they could have a, a, a quality flag that was maybe a different set of characters and you, or, uh, or, or numbers in that case. And the range element uh, definitions might work in your case. I'm not really quite sure what a minimum and a maximum of a character variable means. Um, you could also use a, a record and record set uh, to describe a set of characters that were valid. This is one of those situations where being able to test implementations right away Uh, I still cannot hear you. Sorry. Oh, there, we go. there we go. The blue, uh, the, the uh, speaker. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was wondering whether um, to experiment with, um, to see if Margie uh, in Canberra uh, heard that question and, and answer, response okay. I just wondered whether there was another dimension to it. Um, oh. And uh, if Margie is online uh, with a mic, uh, Margie, you, you can um, yeah. could hear you if you, can you hear have a mic. Can you hear me? A table blaze. Yes. Evan, hello. Uh, yeah. Yes, Evan. You hello. Okay, I'm it. with Margie. Um, the question, the question relates to if we have a range. It, it's not the endpoints of a, a character, a character variable, but the allowable values. All of the avail, uh, allowable values. Can you? Is there a mechanism to cycle back through uh, the MD, MD range dimension so that you can actually, for any one attribute, you can then define the uh, each of the elements that might occur within it. Yeah, the the range element description is something that uh, exists in 19115-2, and it is uh, it. My understanding is that it was created for a situation like this. Um, the concept there was uh, for um, things like land use. <clears throat> where you would have a data set that was that this was that thematic classification and you know one means water you know two means something else um, and so that that is the uh, I believe that that is the where that fits in the conceptual model um, 
how well it works, if it works, uh, how we might make it work are all, uh, I would say, open questions at this point. I don't know of anybody uh, right offhand that has ever, um, I mean, there probably are people around the world that have used that, but I'm not sure who they are. So it's something that we would have to try and, um, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, that's the kind of thing that I do in a lot of situations is you know, work with, with a question like that with, with someone um, that asks it and, and try and come up with something that, that works. In some situations, the answers are clear. In some situations, they're less clear. And this is one where we've got a couple options, both of which might work, and um, we'd have to try them and, and see what happens. Thank you, Ted. Um, we will, um, I'll uh, launch a poll just as a quick interlude while we swap over to the, um, to the second part, uh, Ted, the, uh, the short presentation. Okay. okay. Yeah, these, these polls are an interesting element of, of the GoToWebinar. No, we we want to see how it works. Uh, it's going to be interesting how it works here. Uh, there has to be a vote taken in the room, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just sitting in this vineyard looking at the mountains, so... <laughs> Which way are we going to go? More time to review. Good stuff. Can you 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 Yes, only one or two, no, 8% with one or two questions, and 8% uh, with a lot of questions, and 25% uh, uh, cool with it, and 58% need more time to review what I've just learned, which is uh, the way, or actually 62% now, <laughs> the way those have come in. Okay, so that, that's excellent. Thank you very much for participating in the poll. I'll close that now. Um, so, Ted, um, I think um, we might be running a bit um, a bit tight on time. There was one other question, but I, I think I'll need to pass uh, on that, John, so that we can just move into the next short presentation. Um, we have uh, 20 minutes maximum, Ted. Uh, probably 15 would be better uh, if we could proceed to the second part. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll over okay. to you. Uh, this is the title. Um, we, we live in a world uh, these days where there are a lot of different things that I call metadata dialects. Uh, some people call these different standards. <clears throat> I call them dialects to try and keep in mind that, that there's really a documentation language that, that we're speaking in many different ways. And uh, this just shows a few of those examples. <clears throat> At the center of this is is the ISO standards, and uh, they're there because I, I I think they are probably the broadest of the um, of the dialects. But uh, these other dialects include things that aren't in ISO, uh, you know, specific things. But we're in a world where we need to translate between these things, <clears throat> and um, I'm going to just sort of animate things quickly here. So in this case, we've got two of these dialects A and B and we're translating between them. And I wanted to be able to, to, to know um, what kind of, how much information that I've got in, in A can I translate into B without losing uh, or vice versa. And we're, we're familiar with this, this concept of lossiness in, um, uh, in, in compression. And I'm trying to apply sort of the same kind of idea to uh, the translation process. Uh, one of the things that's important to understand, this is sort of a funny plot, but 
along, obviously you're not reading this, uh, but along the x-axis is metadata elements, and along the y-axis is the number of times that these elements occur in, in a data set or in a collection of metadata. And um, this heterogeneity is, is not unusual. Uh, many collections of you know, data sets are, are very, or many collections of metadata are very heterogeneous. <clears throat> and it's important to understand that and to keep that in mind because obviously in, in, in the middle of this picture, there's, there are some things that are used a lot. And on the edges of this picture, uh, there are some things that are hardly used at all. And so when we're, when we're considering how this dialogue translates, we need, to, we need to keep in mind the difference between those, uh, those two things. This, this, uh, that's what this says. This happened to be a, a collection of 448 uh, CSDGM or FGDC records. There are 161,000 elements. Uh, actually, 10,000, the most common of them were uh, place keywords. So that's these guys in the middle. Um, and place was obviously very important in this community. There was also an element called metadata USGS ERP metadata notes that only occurred in one record out of the 448, and, and 264 elements occurred less than 100 times. So this, this is not unusual. I wanted to show another distribution. This is a collection of project metadata records, and in this case there were 2,700 of them. So I drew a line across here uh, at, at 2,700, which is one element per record. This is a very concentrated uh, metadata profile uh, aimed only at describing uh, projects. So there's only 83 elements. In this collection, there were roughly 380,000 occurrences. And 63 out of 80 of 83 occurred more than once per record, or uh, either once or more per record. So this is an incredibly homogeneous, uh, in contrast to that last picture, this is a very homogeneous collection of metadata and each record has almost all of the elements. And the, the focus in this, I mentioned, is on projects. So there's a lot of contact information and a lot of online resources. So I, I just wanted to make the point that this heterogeneity is very important when we think about translating things. Um, so we take a, a description like that and we put it together with a, a known crosswalk or a known map of the relationship between these. And those go, those go together to calculate this thing I call, call lossiness. So there's three examples, <clears throat> or, or one example, if we have a, del, a data set with 200 elements, and uh, element A is uh, there 134 times, B 50 times, and C 20 times, they make up some percentage of the source. So if, we, if we're doing a translation to some new dialect and we can get A, B, and C, then that would be 100% uh, content translated and zero lossiness. If, if there's no translation for element C, then that's 91% of the elements translated or a lossiness of 9%, uh, which is sort of is the second best we can do here. If we can't um, translate element B, then uh, that would mean we're getting 75% of the, of the elements translated or 75% of the content translated, which is lossiness of, of 25%. So this is uh, a, a very simple uh, calculation. Basically, I sum the, uh, the number of, of I, I sum the, the number of occurrences of each element over the total number of elements. I multiply it by one if it's in the crosswalk and zero if it's not and I subtract that from one to get the, the lossiness. So this is a, a very straightforward thing. I just I take all of the content that's there, I calculate how much of it is in the crosswalk, and, and, and that's lossiness. So um, I was able, uh, with Byron's help, to collect some sample records from New Zealand. I had 280 samples. Um, this is a distribution of of all of the elements that occurred more than 10 times. Uh, I had 287 samples, so, so that, that line, the red line is one per record. 
I uh, transformed these records to uh, from one. These are 19115 records primarily. Uh, I translated them to the new uh, standard, and I was able to get 100% of the elements transformed. Uh, and so the lossiness is actually zero. Um, you know, uh, my caveat is I ignored some attributes. Um, there were a number of attributes in these metadata that were um, things like nil reason attributes on elements that were not required or X-link type attributes on elements that didn't have X-links. Um, and uh, all of those get translated. Um, I mean, they, they uh, do they get translated? Uh, some of them get translated, but those, I, I stopped counting them. So I did, I did do a little bit of uh, scientific data selection here, but I think the bottom line is that for most, I only had 287 uh, records, uh, but but I think that in terms of translating the content of of these New Zealand metadata into 19115-1, uh, there's not going to be a lot of loss that we need to worry about. Now I showed an example earlier earlier of that um, uh, Creative Commons licensing. In that case, because that's a non-standard element or a non-standard class. <clears throat> we'd have to use, we'd have to add something into the to the standard transform to um, account for that. But I think I think we should uh, we should be able to do that. Uh, I mean, obviously, we, if if the crosswalk that I propose there is correct, then uh, that would be a fairly easy thing to do. And uh, that's actually the end of that idea. And uh, if there are any other questions and we have time, I can try and answer them or. Uh, that's my email. Okay. Ted, um, thank you for that. Um, I uh, we do have a, a another question that uh, that came online just uh, before you commenced uh, or early in that presentation, but it's a, a more general question. Um, I'll leave that to you to answer. Uh, the question is, is there a guide, help documentation for how to use which fields in the new standard? Um, the standard itself had a discussion of the changes in the standard. Um, I worked at a place called NOAA in the United States for quite a while, and we created a wiki there uh, that had a lot of information on using 19115. We're currently trying to create something similar for 19115-1, um, and I also have a bunch of some slide presentations like this one that, that try and focus on the differences. Um, so I think I think a guide will be helpful, and um, uh, my goal is um, is to do that in in a in a wiki situation where the uh, the community can contribute experiences and examples. Um, and uh, best practices that emerge from the community, uh, and then hopefully we can we can amass uh, a useful uh, amount of documentation uh, quickly. Thank you, Ted. Um, oh, sorry, um, I, I'm just going to unmute um, uh, Byron. You are now. Yeah, just there we go. You are now. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that a little bit. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to that a little bit. Uh, can you add to that a little bit? Come across here, Byron. It might be easier if you speak into this microphone. Okay. <laughs> Love those links. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, one thing to that. We're working in the Canterbury SDI on a similar concept. Hopefully you'll find a home after the Canterbury SDI is done. But it started out as a tools, concepts, and standards uh, um, 
document that's envisioned to go into a wiki. And so for a local New Zealand context, uh, or New Zealand-Australian context anyway, that could be a useful resource to do a, a similar thing as a NOAA uh, wiki. Yeah. Um, another thing I'm very interested in here is, is systems for evaluating the, the completeness and, and consistency of metadata and connecting those into the wiki, you know, sort of on the web so that we have a, a complete, you know, an evaluation, improvement, and uh, documentation system that is sort of integrated. And uh, we were able to do that um, at NOAA. And we've done it with some uh, with threads and NetCDF. Um, and I'm 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 trying to I've I've been in my current position only for a year and a little bit, and I'm trying to organize uh, support for for things like that. And I think I'm uh, I think I'll, I'll I'll be successful in the soon. The only, you know, I'm I, sorry I, to have that question. I, 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 is that I sent Richard a. Oh. Sorry, I, I I sent Richard a collection of slides that had about 50 improvements, rather than the the 10 or 12 that I showed today. So if there are specific questions uh, that people in the audience have about certain things, uh, or uh, you know, feel free to send me an email, and um, and I'll try and respond, uh, you know, expeditiously. Yes, Ted, there might be an example um, I've just forwarded to you in one of the questions there. Okay. Uh, uh, somewhere around here. Okay, I don't know if I ever see that yet. Well, I'll uh, rather than having you all help me read my email, I can just uh, I'll answer that question. Uh, as soon as I can. That's all right, Ted. And um, we'll we'll probably accept that as the as the last question, Ted, um, oh. as we're getting close to closing. Oh, there is one more question from Margie about ID and UUID, XML attributes, and and the answer is yes. And the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I think what she means by honoring is, you know, are we translating them? And the answer is definitely yes. Sir. Okay, and that could have been Evert uh, answering that question, uh, asking that question. I, I trust as well. Um, also from uh, from Canberra with with Margie. Um, Ted, thank you very much. Um, we're getting to the closing stages. Oops, I lost you, Richard. Ted, we're in the closing stages. Ted, we won't be able to take any more questions, unfortunately. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I can. Um, we've, yes. Been, we, we've been privileged to... Um, have you, uh, lead architect of uh, the metadata implementation standards with us today, Ted. Appreciate it very much. Uh, and Ted, on behalf of all of us down under, I'd like to express our appreciation for your introduction this morning to uh, some of the key characteristics of the new metadata standards and the methods for um, also translation proofing. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to also thank all the attendees for your participation today.
And uh, this is the conclusion of the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Richard. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Thank you. And thanks to everybody. And thanks to everybody. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.